Hello and welcome to another episode of Adventures in Local Marketing, our first of 2021. I'm Christian Bannister, Head of Marketing at Bright Local, and my guest today is Lily Ray. She's an SEO director at digital marketing agency Path Interactive. And on this episode, we talked all about the significant things that happened in SEO in 2020. We'll talk about why it was such a significant year, what the lasting impact may be, and where we go from here. And in the second part, we're going to dive all into 2021. What's coming, how you should prepare, and what you really need to do to deliver success in 2021. So let's jump into my conversation with Lily. Hi, Lily. Thank you so much for coming on Adventures in Local Marketing. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. Well, very excited about having you on. We're going to be talking all about 2020 and then looking ahead to 2021. Now, I know probably a lot of people feel like they want to leave 2020 behind. And undoubtedly, it's been quite a trying year for so many of us, but we do want to spend some time reflecting on it and the impact in SEO. Now, before we jump into all that, I'm really keen to learn more about Path Interactive and your role there. So what does Path Interactive do and what does your role look like? Sure, yeah. So Path Interactive is a digital marketing agency that's, I want to say, about 15 years old now. Uh, We're based in New York City and we also have an office in Nashville as well. Primarily, PATH focuses on search marketing, so um, the the bread and butter of the business has always been SEO and SEM, Um, but in the past several years, it's expanded quite a bit to include um, creative services, web development, uh, web design, analytics. Um, We're doing more with like video and a lot of content marketing and design as well, so um, pretty full suite of digital marketing services and creative services. Uh, My role is SEO director, So uh, we actually have a few directors on the SEO team, so we kind of divvy up responsibilities in different ways. Uh, Me, I I work on half like client strategy and making sure that all of our clients are doing the latest and greatest, you know, SEO techniques and and making sure that we're really just kind of staying focused with our strategies and and getting great results um, for all our different accounts. And then the other half of what I do is uh, more like business development, thought leadership, you know, industry research, and a lot of writing articles and speaking at conferences and things like that. So kind of helping to, you know, maintain or grow the visibility of the agency and get new clients as well. Awesome. I know a lot of our listeners will be really interested in the second part of your role, you know, thought leadership, speaking at conferences. So hopefully towards the end, I can ask you for some advice for anybody who's looking to break into that sort of area. But let's talk about 2020. Now, I guess a lot has happened in SEO on both a macro and micro level. So macro, we have COVID, its impact on the economy, on businesses, on marketing budgets, and of course the impact on us as people. And so that's a huge jumping off point. And I can imagine it would be impossible to cover everything But generally, if we're looking back on 2020, you know, how can we make sense of what happened in SEO with everything else that was going on in the world? Can we make sense of it? (laughs) I did my best in the keynote that I presented last week uh, just to synthesize everything that's happened. Um, But I think you're totally right. Like, you can't talk about SEO or really the world uh, in 2020 without addressing what took place with the pandemic. Um, And I do think that there was a lot of different ways that that manifested itself in in what took place on Google in a lot of different categories. So most obviously things like your money, your life content. So uh, health related content was very heavily impacted by the pandemic. Um, But then things like news as well and like fact checking and misinformation and political content. You know, we also had the election here in the U.S., Um, All of that was definitely impacted in a way where I think the overarching takeaway in terms of what Google tried to do, and they actually say this throughout their documentation, is uh, just surfacing the highest authority, most trustworthy content. 
Um, and in many cases with the pandemic, what happened was like third party publishers weren't really even able to compete in some cases because Google was just surfacing the Center for Disease Control and, and you know, different SERP features that they created to show users what's happening with the pandemic. So it was a tough year to compete for a lot of different keywords because Google was really just focused first and foremost on surfacing uh, like facts <laughs> and not necessarily relying on third party publishers to provide a lot of that content. So do you think that was Google builded on top of something they were already trying to do or was this very much a quick direction change from them? <laughs> Actually, interestingly, they have documents that go back before coronavirus that almost talked about their plans for how to handle something like this. Um, they didn't specifically say a pandemic, but they have in their documentation, like when a crisis is happening, what what happens with their algorithms. Um, but there, there were some new documents that Google put out last year specifically about how it plans to handle the election, how it is handling coronavirus. Um, and a lot of it's all the same consistent thing. They actually talk about EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, and all those documents. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a really big push that they've been focusing on. Um, but I think EAT is like the main driving force behind what Google is trying to do with uh, surfacing high quality trusted content and reducing fake news and misinformation uh, and untrusted content in a variety of different categories. So last year really put all of that to the test. So we've seen probably the most extreme examples of that in play, but it's almost it was there in the background and probably here to stay. Yeah, they actually published a video. Uh, Google published one late last year. Uh, specifically, it's a lot. It's a lot about different aspects of how their algorithms work and everything like that. But they talk specifically about uh, for certain queries that are like controversial or politically charged. Uh, they actually, their algorithms will kind of identify, like, basically, this is a your money, your life, or very controversial query. And they'll prioritize authoritativeness over, like, um, exact match wording and your title tags or things like that, or maybe, like, how recently the article was published, because they know that authoritativeness is more important for certain queries. So I think we actually saw that play out quite a bit, especially during, like, the middle of the year when the pandemic was getting really bad. Um, there's a lot of examples that I found where sites that were able to rank for certain queries were kind of pushed down mm -hmm. during that period when Google was really surfacing like official government websites and, uh, you know, hospitals and things like that. Okay. So I can imagine a lot of businesses probably didn't see that sort of impact, but do you think, you know, EAT is, is kind of being ramped up and that it's actually starting to trickle into other industries? I think that's what they've been doing for the past couple of years is ramping up EAT. I mean, it's pretty clear if you look at who's ranking for a variety of different terms now. So health terms, you know, financial, taxes, like these sites are, are very clearly working hard on improving their EAT or just making those signals very clear throughout the content. Um, and, I, you know, I've analyzed plenty of sites that have started to see improvements from core updates over the past several months or a year or so. And you can actually use something like the Wayback Machine to see what the page looked like three or four years ago compared to what it looks like now. And we work with a lot of clients to make these changes too. So uh, focusing on EAT, I think is not only a great thing for SEO, but it's good for users as well. So I think it's a, a great place to focus. Yeah, of course. I mean, without divulging you know, who the clients are, what sorts of things did you actually have to do with clients who are facing these issues? Mm -hmm. There's so many things. There's, you know, like a, a lot of people try to oversimplify EAT and, and, you know, oh, I added the author name to the page. So I did my duty. <laughs> it's like, that's totally not sufficient. And if you look at what the big players are doing that are able to rank for a lot of these, your money, your life keywords, it's just so many different aspects of what they're doing, not only from an on-page standpoint, but from a linking standpoint, from a, you know, brand reputation standpoint. So things from, you know, making sure your brand just shows up well in the knowledge graph. That's, that could be an EAT strategy. Um, making sure that your reviews on third-party websites look 
decent um, and that people won't have any potential trust issues with the brand. That's, that's also EAT. Um, but what my team and I really focus on is a lot of the on-page signals. And it's not just putting author names. That's a, a part of it. Um, it's really analyzing every feature of the page to make sure that users feel like they can trust the brand and the content. So there's a lot that goes into that. So as a result, are you finding that you're having to do quite a lot more for clients? Because I guess we're getting down to a core content strategy and user experience on a website. Yeah, absolutely. I think the work that uh, we do for certain clients, and you know, I, I try to always make it clear that this isn't something that is like a necessary uh, priority, like uh, the main strategy for every client. We have some clients that aren't affected by Google's core updates and they're able to just perform well without necessarily focusing on something like EAT as a big part of the strategy. Um, but for the clients where it does matter, it really matters and it really changes how we do SEO. Um, that's probably a controversial statement. I think a lot of people think like EAT should have always been part of your strategy, but I really firmly believe that the criteria is a lot higher now. Like, Four or five years ago, I could probably get certain sites to rank for certain queries, and I did get certain sites to rank for certain queries without having real EAT in those categories, and I think that the, the game is totally different now. So at Path Interactive, have you had to change what you're doing? Have you had to bring in new skill sets to tackle some of these problems? Yeah, so it's more about evolving the skills of the people on the SEO team. I mean, for sure, there's certain people that have like a depth of expertise in certain areas where we really try to like, you know, have them work on, on those things. Um, but the SEO team has had to get a lot more like holistic and, and user focused as opposed to doing things like, you know, maybe three or four years ago, you could get away with some type of gray hat strategy where you just make 50 of the same page and you make a, a few tweaks from page to page and maybe that was sufficient for Google to say, oh, this is the best page on the internet. Um, but now my team and I have to go into those pages and say like, this is just, this is not really adding real value. So how can we go into this page and make it really truly valuable for users and not just an SEO strategy? Yeah, and I can imagine there would be a lot more research involved then to kind of evaluate content in industries or categories that you yourself might not be familiar with. Yeah, that's the nice thing about uh, working with advocates at our, you know, at the cl uh, clients and the companies that we work with, because we're having to get a lot more creative and, and use like the data and expertise that our clients have in new ways, which I think is really exciting. I mean, me personally, I think SEO is getting harder over time, but it's also getting more fun and more rewarding because making the same page 50 times and changing five words on the page is not that exciting, but like working with the client to figure out how we can take those 50 pages and make them really truly valuable and, and, you know, tapping into their customer service teams or tapping into this, their localized expertise. Um, it's a lot more fun, a lot more creative. So what else has been significant? Doesn't necessarily need to be related to COVID, but what are the things that people should have been paying attention to in 2020? Mm -hmm. So Google's rolled out a handful of new features. Many of them were tied to COVID, but not necessarily something that everybody could benefit from. So like, you know, with Google My Business, they rolled out a lot of changes that businesses could use during COVID and still can use. Um, but there's also been a lot of other updates to Google My Business in general. So I think every company that has a Google My Business page or can have a Google My Business page should be spending a lot of time paying attention to the different features that Google is offering there because, you know, things like products or attributes um, or even just posts, like there's a lot of innovations that are happening there. And I think that uh, they're low hanging fruit in terms of like, ranking factors for local SEO, you know, it's like something that you can go press a button and probably see a change in performance the next day. So <laughs> I would definitely encourage people to pay attention to Google My Business, even if it's just like your corporate headquarters uh, account. 
Um, but then there's a lot of focus on Google's part as well with uh, all things mobile and speed and interactivity. So obviously Core Web Vitals is the big upcoming change, um, but that also has a big implication as far as AMP, which is pretty interesting that you won't have to use AMP anymore for uh, to be eligible to appear on top stories on mobile. And then I just think in general, there's a lot of updates related to like the interactivity of uh, the page as well as the search results. So changes to structured data, um, you know, focusing on things like dump links and, and site links and accordions on the page and just making sure the page is very easy to use and fast loading on mobile devices is important. Yeah, so do you think with some of the changes to GMB, I guess there was a slight forced hand from Google's part because this was such an important place where local businesses would be given information to consumers. So they almost needed to support them with that. Do you think it's just been a, a bit of a flash in the dark sort of thing with Google My Business? Or do you think Google are purposefully focusing more time and attention in adding new features and giving more value to local businesses who use Google My Business? I think <laughs> Google's heart is in the right place and the Google My Business team, their heart is in the right place, but they have a, a pretty daunting task, which is to manage, a, you know, a, a product that is so heavily spammed and manipulated at all times. So I think, yeah, for sure, they were trying to do the right thing with the pandemic. I think, uh, you know, for a while they were like, they paused new reviews because the, you know, potential negative impacts that that could have on local businesses. Um, but at the same time, there's this other problem with Google My Business, which is that there's just rampant spam and, and you know, deception and manipulation. And so I think uh, it's, it's tough uh, for the Google My Business team to do everything right. <laughs> it's a, there's a lot of uh, difficulties with that product, but I think uh, especially as it relates to COVID, there, there were a lot of really nice things that they tried to do. And um, these new features do allow businesses to kind of like innovate their local strategy to some extent. So I think that's been helpful for a lot of companies we work with. So let's say I did absolutely nothing to change my SEO strategy last year. What really should I have done? So I think that uh, it depends what your SEO strategy looked like and what category you're in. Um, so let's say you were like already good to go with, you know, mobile first indexing, you know, if, if page speed and, and performance has been a priority for you, you know, in, in 2020 or before 2020, then you're probably mostly in a good spot for 2021. But I do think that, um, you know, content quality and EAT should be a focus for, for many sites. Um, assuming that you're doing things right in terms of providing valuable content, making sure it's well edited, that it's unique, um, that you're not just repurposing content that's you know, found elsewhere without adding any real unique value. If all of those kind of like fundamental principles of how you approach SEO are in place, then you're probably gonna be fine for 2021. But I think the only real things that are changing uh, explicitly that Google's mentioned is uh, like core web vitals. That's really the one big thing that I think you should be measuring those metrics now and making sure that you're in a good spot for them. Everything else has pretty much been pretty universal for the past several years. So with core web vitals, I mean, do you have a sort of measure of how many of your clients or just businesses in general might be needing to really react to this now? Because I guess we're a few months away from it being rolled out. Well, the SEO industry certainly loves talking about it. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's kind of unusual for Google to give us a uh, you know, specific warning about certain new ranking factors with so much lead time. So um, presumably a, a lot of sites have been focusing on this and, and doing their best to be in a good spot for when they roll this out in May. Uh, for some sites, you know, we, we only really focus on it for clients where we feel like it's really a severe problem and where it could really have a big impact. Um, I think for many sites, like it's 
page speed is hasn't ever really been the biggest ranking factor and maybe isn't going to be a huge ranking factor assuming that the content's really good and usability is generally okay there's always optimizations that you can do with page speed um, but for certain clients like especially um, like news publisher clients come to mind maybe where there's like really aggressive advertising um, you know e-commerce pages page speed should be really good on if you have an e-commerce store because you don't want to lose your customers because the page doesn't load quickly enough so I think there's certain categories where it's more important but I don't like we don't have a rule of thumb about like oh your CLS score is X so you have a big problem on your hands it's more about like overall usability and experience I think yeah they've obviously got some of the metrics in Google Search Console now and I guess just speaking from the bright local site you know we do get flagged up on a couple of them not in a huge way but some of them when we've actually looked at well what actually might be causing this it seems like it's actually core functionality to the website you know things like drop downs uh, things like uh, tabs navigation that we believe they actually offer a good user experience, but because there might be a very slight amount of layout shift, it's actually getting flagged up. Hmm. Now, should we be going, look, we've got to get rid of anything that might be flagged, or should we say, well, actually, if this offers value to the user, it's usable, and it makes sense for the things they're trying to do, it's actually fine to keep? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I think that gets into, like, whether we should be focusing on these metrics or whether we should really be asking ourselves what's best for the user. Um, another example, that, like the one you just mentioned is, uh, you know, we have certain clients that use AMP, but the uh, core web vital scores for mobile, according to Google Search Console, are not necessarily that great, but we know that we use AMP. So it's like, should we be laser focused on the mobile core web vitals for those clients? Maybe not, maybe there's other things that are more important. Um, and that's not necessarily like super obvious from the data. You know, if you go into Search Console, you might see a big red flag, but um, that's where you have to use your best judgment. So I think, I don't think that cumulative layout shift was built so much with the intention of like, you know, navigation or things like that. It's more about, I mean, the example that Google uses is like when you're trying to check out and the whole page moves under your cursor <laughs> like that's the main problem or obviously ads i think ads are probably the primary focus so making sure that you don't have a website that is like deceiving your users or making it hard to, to use the page content because of how you lay things out focus on that more so than the numbers themselves that would be my advice yeah that's that's how we've been thinking about it the hope is that Google can actually interpret the difference between that. So a button shifting before you tap it and you've accidentally you know, bought something that you didn't mean yeah. to. Obviously, do we think Google's gonna be able to understand that sort of user journey and then flag only those instances? Or is this a really temperamental canary in the mind that's gonna go off for anything on a site or do we just not know yet? It's hard to say, but I would have to imagine between the trillions and trillions of data points that Google has that they'll be able to figure out a poor user experience. It might not just be measuring, you know, CLS the way that a browser toolbar extension is measuring it, but it's probably more to do with like, people are really quick to leave that page and go find another answer on Google. Like if they see a lot of that happening, then there's probably some indications that there might be some issues with usability on the page, but I don't work on the Google engineering team, so I don't exactly know how they would come to those conclusions, but I always just assume they have the brightest minds in the entire world working on it, so they've probably figured something out. Okay, hopefully, hopefully. We'll soon see, come May, yeah. where we're always scrambling to make sure our, we have no interactivity on our website, just because we might set off Google Search Console. Exactly, exactly. So what else should we be keeping an eye out for in 2021? I think uh, one of the big things that my team and I are working on is basically to make sure that uh, the pages that we do allow Google to index and encourage Google to index are the best pages. And then on the flip side, 
cleaning up a lot of pages that shouldn't be indexed. <laughs> Maybe they should have at one point, but now they don't need to be anymore. It's amazing, like, if you just take that strategy and apply that to so many different sites, that'll keep you busy for all of 2021. So, like, we have a lot of clients that their websites are 15 or 20 years old. And maybe they've published 30 new pieces of content every day for the past 15 years. Guess what? 90% of that content doesn't do anything for you anymore. But Google's spending time crawling it and trying to determine if it's valuable and it's not. So it's like now from their perspective, 90% of your website's not valuable. But from your perspective, you keep producing this 10% of new stuff that is valuable. So it's like what we have to do, what my team and I spend a lot of time doing is like a gut check with our clients about how much do we really need all this stuff to be indexed? You know, how many times have you written the same thing five times over the course of 15 years? And maybe that can just be one page. And that produces a tremendous amount of work. So I would say a lot of what my team and I spend time on is analyzing that data and coming up with strategies for how to make sure we're putting our best foot forward with the content that we allow to be indexed. So do you meet a lot of resistance from clients who worry that, you know, this stuff, we've spent a lot of time in the past creating it or, you know, this stuff could be ranking, we don't want to get rid of it. Is that is there a lot of education that goes <laughs> alongside it? Surprisingly, uh, a lot of the clients that we work with don't, they're not resistant to this approach because they understand the problem that they have on their hands. And granted, like, again, this doesn't apply to every website. So there's certain, you know, companies that have 500 URLs on their site and all of them are fine. And like this, this isn't necessarily a problem for them, but for a lot of the sites, especially the ones that are heavily impacted by core updates, we tend to notice patterns with really low quality content that's there for one reason or another. In many cases, it's unintentional. Like, oh, we didn't realize we had 500, um, you know, help center pages that have two sentences of content on them each. <laughs> like, we didn't mean to do that. Um, so we identify those opportunities. And when we show the clients the data, you know, this has received zero to five clicks in the past year, you know, per page. Maybe there's a better way of structuring this. Most of the time, they're like, yes, absolutely, let's do that. Um, I, I think very rarely nowadays do you get somebody like, oh, I, I, I wrote that article 17 years ago, and it's really important to me that it keeps ranking, even though it hasn't done anything in five years. <laughs> like, They tend to understand the data. And so how about if you're working with a client who isn't in that situation? So... Are you thinking about new things that you could be doing based on what's happened over the last year uh, to, to help improve their performance in 2021? Yeah, it's, this is one of the things I love most about my job is um, it's never the same thing for two clients. It's really not. Um, so sometimes there's overlapping strategies, but uh, I have a client, for example, that we have a path that uh, has been a client of mine for, I want to say seven years, so even before I was at PATH. I've worked with them in a prior agency. And coming up with ideas for how to keep their SEO strategy fresh after this many years, <laughs> we have some clients that we've had at PATH for 10 years or 12 years. It's like, it never really stops. So you have to get really creative with what to keep doing. You know, it's not just about tweaking title tags. It's about like, how do we continue to add value for our customers all the time? And the nice thing about SEO is like, the world always changes. So customers' needs always change and questions always change. And almost every one of our clients was impacted by COVID in some way. Mm -hmm. and people's circumstances have changed. So like, what are we doing to uh, account for that and to strategize based on our customers' new situations? So we've done a lot of that in the past year. And so do you work with many local clients at Path Interactive? And if so, you know, what sorts of clients are they and, and what are the services that you provide them? We do for sure. Um, we have a lot of different uh, franchise-based clients. Um, we have clients that offer services throughout like the US, for example, that uh, in some cases don't have brick and mortar locations, which makes things extra interesting and challenging. Um, 
we have some clients that have like maybe 10 locations around the US um, or like a couple different like corporate headquarters in different places around the US, but they offer localized services. So for sure, local is a really big part of our strategy. Um, and I mean, again, like Google My Business is the primary focus for most of them. But as I mentioned before, with like things like localized landing pages, we like to do everything in our power to make those pages as helpful as possible. So a lot of what our strategy is focused on in the past couple of years has been like working with those companies to really identify what it is that makes their service unique from place to place if possible and making sure that that's reflected on the site. So like Home Depot is not a client of mine, but I've always used them as an example of a company that does this really well. Because if you, uh, if you look at their local landing pages, it's like, wow, there's how, you know, hundreds of Home Depot locations around the US, but all of their pages are totally different. And yeah. they've kind of figured that out. So we try to use those same approaches with our clients. And do you find that the likes of Home Depot are an outlier within large multi-location franchises and businesses that many of them don't actually think of competing at a local level because maybe they rely on above the line advertising and just general high brand awareness to compete? I think more and more companies with that structure understand the importance of local SEO for sure. I think that it's, you know, it's a, it's like a no brainer. If you're a company like Home Depot that has that many locations, like you've probably spoken to people like, you know, yeah, extra bright local or like one of these companies by now and about the, the necessity of having a local strategy. But I don't know that every one of these companies is doing everything they can with local SEO, or maybe they're not thinking about local SEO as kind of like a separate or a niche uh, product or strategy within SEO, which I, I really truly think it is. So um, there's always more opportunity. And the nice thing about Google My Business, for example, is they roll new stuff out every week. I mean, last week they rolled something out with like new GMB reporting. So it's like, it's always innovating. So there's always more that you can do. And do you think GMB is actually keeping pace with that? You know, are they making it easy for large multi-location businesses to actually manage Google My Business at scale? Mm, no. <laughs> I think, <laughs> think there's other tools on the market that do a better job of allowing professionals to manage things at scale. I think that's one big opportunity for Google My Business to potentially improve. Um, and I also, as I mentioned before, I think there's a pretty big problem with spam in certain categories, unfortunately. So I don't want to blame Google for it because it's like a massive, you know, undertaking and the spammers are very, very intent on, on <laughs> coming up with a bunch of creative ways to spam Google My Business all the time. But it's clearly very hard for them to keep up with this problem. So it's interesting that um, one of the main things that we work on and that I know a lot of local SEOs work on is like spam redressal forms as part of our strategy, which is kind of unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. It's, you know, it's different than regular SEO. I think Google's maybe done a better job of, of combating spam. Maybe not, but uh, I think it's a bigger problem on GMB. So that's something that all local SEOs should unfortunately probably focus on. Yeah, it comes around time and time again. And it also feels like it's something that many local SEOs just aren't prioritizing, maybe because the success rate of actually getting spam removed is quite low or the process to do it is time consuming. I mean, do you have any tips on how you should go about doing spam fighting in a more efficient way? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, it is a pretty manual process and it does take a long time. And it's, uh, it's kind of frustrating because it's like, you know, if you submit 30 spam redressal forms in a week, there's probably a thousand new spam listings in that category in the same week. So it's like a really daunting process. Um, I would say hopefully more local SEOs are learning about this as part of their strategy because I think all that data helps Google to potentially identify spam in the future and maybe they'll get better at it. 
Um, but it is pretty frustrating because it's like I have some clients that are your money, your life in, in the local space and they offer like literal services that save lives. And we have to spend time combating spam in those industries, which is kind of a bummer. So hopefully Google gets better at that. I mean, it only makes sense then if they've gone all in on your money or your life for organic SEO and it's playing out in local, surely that needs to be something they focus on. I would think so. I've uh, kind of raised the flag about the issue. I know others are doing the same a few times uh, last year and there's been some big publications that talk about this big problem. And, you know, I know it's something that Google's aware of, but I do think that as far as like focusing on, on EAT for your money or life content, they could be doing more with local for sure. So how about you in 2021? Do you have any plans or big ambitions? Survive. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, uh, yeah, I I do. Um, I'm going to be doing a handful of different talks and articles and things like that. Um, I'm working pretty closely with Systrix, which provides visibility data for uh, any site that you want to analyze. So one thing that uh, I'm working on right now with them is I'm publishing biggest winners and losers in 2020. So I've already published the winners last week. I'm going to be publishing the losers later this week. Um, and really just that allows me and my team to keep an eye on like what companies are doing that are seeing success. So some of the sites that have benefited from 2020, like Zoom, for example, that's not necessarily something where we're going to go and try to emulate their SEO strategy because that's not the reason they saw such a big increase. But, um, you know, especially as it relates to your money, your life sites and publishers where we do see that they're consistently seeing gains, uh, you know, just identifying who they are and then being able to dig into their strategies and what they're doing with their content. I think it's something that's really helpful for our team. Great. So one of them's live and you're about to publish the next one. So we'll drop a link to both of those in the show notes once they've dropped and people can go and check those out. Great. So you're a regular speaker at conferences like uh, we mentioned earlier. So many people are keen to do this. Many marketers are keen to start speaking at events and are often nervous about taking that first step. So what advice would you have for someone in this situation who wants to take that step in 2021? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey because, uh, I tell this story sometimes, but like before starting to speak at, at SEO conferences and at SEO events, I was really scared of public speaking, (laughs) like petrified of public speaking. Um, and what was my experience with it is like, when you find something to talk about that you actually are really deeply like experienced in and passionate about, it's, it becomes pretty natural. So I would say like really only do speaking if you feel like you've identified something that you are like really passionate about, like instead of just kind of gratuitously like, Oh, I'm going to pitch this topic to this conference because I want to speak, but like, it's probably the same thing that a lot of other people are talking about. Or maybe like, I don't have anything unique to add. So I would wait until you really feel like there's something that's like new and different and interesting and that you feel really well-versed in and really experienced in. Because that's when you kind of start to pick up traction for like, wow, that person had something new and, and interesting to say. And at least in my experience, that feedback of feeling like people are really getting value from what you're saying it's a nice confidence boost and it makes you feel better about the next talk because you shift your thinking from like, I'm on stage, everybody's looking at me, everybody's criticizing me or whatever the case may be to like, I know that when I tend to share this kind of stuff, people find it valuable. So I feel a lot better about speaking. Great. And you're not just on stage talking about SEO. You also DJ. I've uh, seen a few of your live streams on Twitter over the last month or so. So this could be a really silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. But is there anything in DJing that you actually find translates over into your day-to-day SEO work? Yeah, it's actually not the first time that I've been asked that question, which is pretty funny. Um, 
No, but it's a, it's a good question, and it's something that was pretty funny to me over the past couple of years because uh, it's not like the actual act of DJing is similar to the act of doing SEO in any way. They're pretty different things, but uh, the social aspect of both things have a lot of consistencies. So, like, um, you know going to being invited backstage and meeting your DJ heroes and like collaborating with different DJ artists or producers or whatever. A lot of that like networking aspect of being a musician is very turning out to be very similar to the SEO world where it's like, hey, like Bill Slavsky and I wrote an article together and that reminded me of making a track with somebody else. So it's like making these connections and, and just collaborating with people and getting to meet a lot of the people that you have, admire in your work, that aspect of it has been kind of interestingly similar. That's cool. Um, yeah, I often don't get to talk about myself on the podcast, but I actually got into marketing by running my own club night. So it was nice. completely accidental. So it was about a, over a decade ago, which is slightly depressing, <laughs> but we were in the situation where we lived in our city and nobody played the music we liked wow so almost like a classic startup tale of we had this problem and we went about creating the solution by hosting our own night so somewhere we could listen to the music we liked and get really drunk so that was basically all we wanted to do um and then we like took on a venue without really planning much and then realized yeah we've got to fill this and so in a way we looked at well what what are the usual ways that people try to get uh, punters through the doors so handing out flyers on the streets uh, putting up posters advertising in local magazines and we weren't really able to do that because we didn't have any money and we also just didn't want to be standing outside venues at 3 a.m handing out flyers <laughs> that's sketchy yeah exactly so it's like we so we basically took to myspace which is also showing my age and tried to promote our night pretty much exclusively there so one thing we noticed is obviously loads of people are on it and no other clubs were actually using social media. I mean, social media was literally MySpace, but <laughs> no one was using MySpace to connect with their audience. So we created a profile. We found people who liked the same sort of music that we were going to be playing and added them as friends. We ran some competitions. We even did like content marketing because we put our mixes up in our profile. And then that led on to us creating a blog where we talked about the tracks we liked and putting more mixes up there and so like we actually managed to make it you know fairly successful in our city you know we hosted some some good nights got some you know good djs to come and play for us and it wasn't until i actually got into marketing when i was looking back at it and i was like i basically built out a marketing strategy by accident <laughs> that's awesome yeah we were like we didn't know what we were doing but it was like we had a problem we thought of a solution for it. We thought, actually, we've got to find if there's an audience for this. And then we picked a channel and we went pretty hard on it. And then Love it. We, we just came up with loads of tactics. And it's like, it's always something to come back to. And I think when people have these kind of like side projects or, or passions, so much of that can be worked into your your day-to-day -day work in life, whatever you're doing, really. Yeah. Well, first of all, what kind of music was it? I'm very curious. It was probably mid 2000s to 2010 so it was french electro yes was like justice and ed banger yes i loved that music at that time <laughs> yeah so it's very much that no one was really playing it and then i guess we also learned to adapt based on kind of the taste changing so we started moving towards a bit more techno and deep house so there was a kind Excellent. of this continual reinvention uh just to keep up with not just what we liked but also what the audience liked that's awesome. I love that. I mean, that's the, first of all, that, that music is great. Uh, but second of all, like, that's kind of the same reason I fell into SEO. And, and like, what I think makes a good SEO is that, uh, that like, passion or that problem solving and, and creativity when it comes to, like, how can we use the internet to make this thing bigger? You know, and at the time it was MySpace, but really that's, that's what we're doing every day. Now it's Google and now it's, you know, different social channels and, um, you know, Google My Business. Like, there's so many different tools available, and it's all about being creative and figuring out what works. So, that's a cool anecdote. I like it. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks for letting me indulge as well. I mean, of course. obviously right. I saw that you're a DJ and it's like, this is probably my only opportunity to talk <laughs> about the fact that I used to be cool and ran club night. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, I haven't been into a club. I mean, obviously no one's been into a club, but I haven't been into a club going on about three years. So hopefully... Should go back when it's safe. Go wild. Revisit. Yeah, exactly. Revisit everything. Brilliant. So I usually ask our guests for some advice to impart on our listeners before you leave. So I wanted to ask you, firstly, what do you think is a really undervalued skill in an SEO? Mm, I keep saying problem solving, but I, I do think that that like creativity and problem solving are the two that I think are like the most important and what the people on my team who are just amazing, what they do really well is like, really putting themselves in the shoes of their users for a lot of different clients. Um, so like we're using things like SparkToro now, which talk about, you know, what, where do our, our clients, audiences spend their time and kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of, of those searchers and figuring out what are their unique needs and how are those needs changing? Because right now everything's changing very rapidly. So being able to come up with creative strategies like what we just talked about to meet those ever-changing needs, I think that that's what makes a good SEO great. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can underestimate problem solving and creativity in marketing and SEO. It's just like if you're able to just do research but also have street smarts about what you're doing, I think it takes you a long way. Yeah, I think gone are the days of just memorizing, like, ranking factors. It's not enough anymore. That's important, but it's not enough. Like, you really have to think outside the box because your competition's thinking outside the box. Yeah, for sure. And so what advice would you give to yourself back when you started in SEO based on what you know now? Um, probably just, like, identifying what you're good at and maybe there are certain aspects of the job that you're not as good at or you don't enjoy doing as much and like figuring what that figuring out what that is because it's okay to not like every aspect of SEO and it's also okay to not be amazing at every aspect because it's physically impossible i'm sorry <laughs> there's no one that's amazing at all of it it's just so many different things so what i like to do one of the reasons i love working at, at my agency is that we divvy up tasks. So it's like this person loves doing that stuff. That's what they're super, super good at. They get to do that. You know, I have a technical SEO director on my team who's a million times better at technical SEO than me. And he loves doing that. So like, that's what he does, as opposed to me pretending like that's my, you know, main skill set, because it's not. So I think uh, if you could just identify what are the areas of SEO that you love the most and that you feel like you're really good at, and you really want to dive deep into those areas, do that instead of trying to become a jack of all trades because then you might just sell yourself short. Great advice. Brilliant. Well, Lily, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you for letting me talk about my club night as well. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, best of luck in 2021. Likewise. Thanks again. Thanks again to Lily for joining me on this episode. We'll be back again very soon with another guest and another topic. Now, in the meantime, I'd really love to hear your feedback about the show. And the best way you can do this is to head to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave us a review. And while you're there, feel free to leave suggestions on topics you'd like us to cover. We'll try to make sure we're covering as many of them as possible this year. I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you again very soon.